So welcome to the Take a Breather podcast with Stacey Every and Eric Almeida. We are certified emotional freedom technique practitioners. And on this podcast, we discuss how EFT can improve your mental and physical health by bringing real healing to the body and to the mind. We also have different types of practitioners visit us on the show to tell us about their methods and how they can facilitate deep healing. As always, if you're in need of support, you can always contact Stacy or myself, and we can help guide you on your path of personal healing. And our contact information is in the show notes. And please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, like, and subscribe to us on YouTube. That helps the podcast out a ton. And today we'd like to introduce Charleston Gaines, he is a professional speaker and life coach with expertise in suicide prevention, emotional intelligence, and positive psychology. He is an Air Force veteran, a certified trauma professional, and a doctoral candidate in health psychology. Welcome, Charleston, to the, co- to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm grateful to be here. For Thanks. sure. And take it away, Stace, with the first question. Yeah. So can you just, I'll start off just telling us about who you are and what it is that you do. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Charleston Gaines. And what I do is I use emotional intelligence primarily to help people and empower them to love themselves and feel whole again. I just feel like I feel that a majority of our issues just in, across society are really based on just how people perceive themselves and the misery that they find themselves in daily. And so I do that through primarily professional speaking and life coaching, but I have a couple other um, avenues as well, Facebook group, podcast, a couple of books I contributed to, but primarily speaking and coaching to empower people to love themselves and feel whole again. Yeah, the term emotional intelligence, can you speak more to what that what that means to you? Like, what does it mean to be emotionally intelligent? And and then also, like, why is it so important? Well, emotional intelligence is really understanding like your emotions, what they are and how to influence your emotions in a way that you can elevate your life and enhance the lives of the people around you. And then I think you asked the second question. Yeah, like, (laughs) yeah, well, I guess you kind of answered it like the, um, but why is it so important to have that intelligence? And and you kind of answered it with your, like, it, the definition kind of explains why it's necessary. So I see you're also a certified trauma professional and I'm wondering what, what that, what someone in that role does exactly and how it interferes. Cause I, I can see where there's like a direct interface between the, how much trauma we have and what, how emotionally intelligent we are. Well, to be a certified trauma professional, what that really meant was that I, I went through this um, multi-day seminar to learn specific things about trauma. However, my, my schooling, you know, being a doctoral candidate is primarily focused on trauma. And the reason that's so important is because, and everyone, it just seems everyone has experienced trauma to some degree. And you can look at the, like the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it outlines what trauma is as far as being diagnosed with PTSD. But in reality, in your life, if, if you call something traumatic in your life, no one else can tell you that you're incorrect. Mm. And so we have to understand that because a lot of the misery and the self-hate and the self-doubt, all of that comes from our negative experiences in life. And so emotional intelligence enables you to process that in a way that you can really elevate your life from, from that. So it's emotional intelligence and, well, actually, I want to back up for a second. Are you saying the only diagnosis in the DSM is for any kind of trauma is PTSD? Well, well, no, it's when you, when you look at the, when you look at the diagnostic criteria for PTSD and then in the beginning, it outlines what a trauma is. So there's multiple criteria. And the first criteria is you experience the trauma and it says something like it was either, you know, great fear of threat to your life or limb or exposure to someone else. So it's, it's a pretty direct and specific definition of trauma. However, if you went through something, so here's the way that I look at trauma and how it differentiates from the DSM-5, because let's understand first the DSM-5, honestly, let's be honest, the DSM-5 is a list of symptoms 
that if you match these symptoms, we can label you with this, which enables you to get prescribed this. Yep. And so, you know, <laughs> and, and so that, that's what its purpose is now primarily, but that's not what it was first developed for. And PTSD was first introduced to the DSM in the DSM-3 in 1980. And- That recently? Yes. Yeah, so before they called it wow. other things, right? Like shell shock and, and it had oh, other sure. terms. But so they didn't really look at, well, even the DSM-4 kind of said that PTSD was kind of a stress or anxiety disorder and they didn't really look at trauma as a whole separate category. But the way that I look at trauma is not necessarily how we define the events, right? Whether you got shot at or whether you got beat up or something like that. I look at it more as how your nervous system reacted. And so maybe this person got was, was in Iraq and their vehicle got hit with an IED and it triggered a certain physiological response. And this other person, maybe there was no real threat, but their mind perceived it that way. So they had the same physiological response, which is why I say that I cannot tell you, no, that wasn't a trauma. I can't tell you that it wasn't. I can tell you that maybe I wouldn't have been scared in that situation. But all that is saying is that we're human. Like that's not even an argument. So, <laughs> and, no, and so- and so for me, when you back to the question about being a certified trauma professional, to me, what it is, is, is really understanding what trauma is and then being able to incorporate that into the work that you do. So many people are involved in different kinds of work and they don't fully grasp what trauma is, especially from a physiological standpoint. So even looking at, at some people that I've spoken to that have Talk, they've been to therapy, maybe cognitive behavioral therapists, for example. But those, you know, that CBT is being delivered by someone that doesn't fully grasp the physiological aspects of trauma, right? They, they have their workbook, they have their steps, and those things have proven effective. But I need you to understand what's happening in the brain. And then we can go from there. No, it, it's totally true. It's it's something that Stacey and I have talked about a lot with the EFT work that we do that when we refer to trauma in our field, we always kind of go with like, we refer to trauma as the lowercase t, meaning like something that provoked a strong emotional response. And just like what you were saying, Charleston, it's like, it may not have been literally life-threatening, but if that same self-protection system gets activated and it's perceived as life-threatening, it's the body and the mind treats it exactly the same. You know, the IED example that you gave, which is a, an obvious example of a trauma to pair, compare to what could just have been something like, you know, bullying in school where the, the person may not have been in actual physical danger, but the per perpetual impact of the event over and over again kept them in that state of, where they, where they felt that they were in imminent, imminent fear. And so it's, you're right in, in the, with the limitations of the DSM that it, it's really just a, can we put a label on you for the insurance companies to pay for your services kind of thing. And your medication. And your medication. Right. Yeah, it's unfortunately, like it, it's just, it's, it's, it's very limited in that capacity. Yeah, you know, it, it really is. And for me, that's why I feel more people need to understand how emotional intelligence is really the foundation of your healing so that you need less of that. You know, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of people get prescribed antidepressants, which are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What that means is that basically the drug modifies how your brain produces and uses serotonin. So if we could teach more people how to influence their serotonin production themselves, fewer of them will need the medication. And the reason that's important is because the insurance companies can tell you how much medication you can or cannot have, how much therapy, maybe they'll pay for 12 sessions or 15 sessions. Okay, maybe they only 12, pay for 12 sessions, but emotional intelligence, emotional regulation are informing you that you can do mindfulness meditation every day and that you can 
go beyond just the reduction of symptoms into living the full life that you desire and deserve. I, I can think of a bunch of different ways in which you would help your clients. And one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, the DSM reflects, I think, a cultural perception about trauma yes. and how <laughs> much, um, I mean, I think of so many people who say, my childhood was fine. And because, it, you know, it's, like my grandmother had a near drowning experience. And her parents were like, ah, you're fine, you know, brush her off. She was terrified of water the rest of her life. And she thought she was weak and, you know, and she was ashamed of it because she thought it was her fault that she was, you know, no one ever talked about the possible traumatic you know, impact of almost drowning. And that there's a general like, you know, buck up kid, you're fine, it's no big deal. And, and so how much of our own, and I know adverse childhood experiences is another term thrown around right now, as far as, you know, how you have a certain number of adverse childhood experiences and what physiological effects that has, uh, especially with like complex trauma, but um, how many, ex just educating people that the little, that, that was a little T, that was a trauma that you experienced, that was not something to brush aside and you needed support at the time and you didn't get it and you're allowed to ask for it now. And you know, so just that kind of shifting that perception of the things that I, that I suffered in my childhood were no big deal, that they are a big deal, but that it doesn't reflect on any, it's not any weakness on your part that you're dealing with them now. You're just, it's, it's just what's, it's, it's you taking care of yourself and there's no shame. There's no, I wonder how much of that stuff, I kind of talk a lot, how much of that stuff you do you know, work with, with clients who just have a hard time seeing that what they, what they experienced was in fact trauma that they can now that, that is in fact in, impacting their their happiness. You know, you you mentioned that, and it is really it's it's a profound topic that we need to cover more often. Quite quite often, what happens is we need people to validate this. So if I say it was traumatic, I need to ask people, do I have permission to use that word? And so what what has to happen is people need to to really own all of those aspects of their lives. It hurt because I said it hurts. You know, and I'll give you an example. I've been told before that I am too sensitive. And I just took out the word too. I'm sensitive and I accepted it. And I could not continue to wait for someone else's permission to do that. And so the first thing we have to do is get people to recognize that you don't need someone else's permission to say that it hurts. Like you own that, you're responsible for that. And so that goes back to dealing with people's self-worth. And when you mentioned shame, oh, that's such a big part of it. Because if I am hurting, like in the example you gave, if I, maybe I was nowhere near drowning, but I thought I was. And then you say, oh, you weren't even drowning. Like you're just, you're just acting up or whatever. And then maybe you tell that story to a couple of family members and they laugh at me together. That's, that's shame. And that shame, and it's not like, I'm not embarrassed because I fell in the water. Everyone falls in the water. I'm ashamed because I'm weaker than everyone else who fell in the water. And so if that is one event of many before the age of seven or eight, how does that impact you across the lifespan? And so when dealing with people who are trying to elevate their happiness, it's not about how was work last week. What did someone tell you when you were seven that you've been fighting this whole time? There are adults that are still trying to answer the question, what's wrong with you? Because they were asked that in fourth grade. They're mm -hmm. still trying to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are some of the tools you recommend for clients on like, I mean, because it's, it's one thing to say, hey, you should, you know, words go so far, right? You should feel good about yourself. We're all valuable. And then there's feeling the truth of that. Well, it, it kind of depends on the client, either, you know, working from chronologically, right? Working from what's going on today and working ourselves backwards or starting from childhood and working our, our, our way forward. And so if I'm starting with modern day, and I, and I say this because you can come across clients who on paper are very successful, but they hate their life 
and they have no self-confidence. Okay, that's not because of what happened last week. Last week, you won an award. So it's not from last week. So where did that come from? Let's figure that out. And then you have people that their life sucks today, where they're just like, got in trouble at work, you know, significant other left me, got in an argument, whatever, something like that. So I try to figure out where are you right now? Then what direction should we move in? So if you are, my primary thing is if you're struggling with your self-worth based on what's going on in your life today, I get people to figure out two things. What do they want and what are their values? And so when I, when I ask you what you want, for example, I'll ask you five or six times. So I can say, what do you want? Well, I want my, I want my wife to, I don't know, to appreciate me more. Okay, what do you want? I, I want people to notice the things that I do. What do you want? And then six or seven questions in, you get to the point, the answer is, I want to feel appreciated and worthy. So it's not even about your, your spouse because they already appreciate you. The problem is the appreciation that they show you is not enough because you're putting your worth and value based on your interpretation of their actions instead of you looking at yourself. So first, you got to figure out what you want. Okay, I want to feel appreciated. I want to feel valued. And then let's look at your values because you need to align your thoughts and actions with your values. And then let's use that to determine if you had a good day or not. So if my value is honesty, did I tell the truth in difficult situations? If the answer is yes, then be proud of that. Don't look at the number of sales calls you made because I'm not saying were you a good employee, I'm saying, did you live up to your values? And so when you can begin to align your thoughts, values and actions, then you're able to have pride in what you've done every day from one day to the next. We don't have to quantify it. I can ask you a yes or no question. Did you live up to your values today? And then the last part of that is about self-judgment. Because if I ask you every day, did you live up to your values? You're gonna to get to a no. <laughs> you're, you're yep, we're have, human at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna have days you're like, no, I didn't. This happened and I lied. I looked him in the eye and lied dead through my teeth because I was scared. Okay, so what we wanna do is we want to say, choose to hold yourself accountable, don't judge yourself. I can say, I lied because I'm a liar. Well, that's self-judgment and that doesn't help. Mm. I can say, I lied because I was afraid, so I'm going to work on being less afraid. Hold yourself accountable. What was that lie? Do you need to own up to it and go confess tomorrow? That's holding yourself accountable. And if you go confess tomorrow that you lied today, that aligns with your value of honesty. And you can be proud of that. And so we have to move away from self-judgment and move towards accountability. And then, you know, but just, just on, on the flip side of that, where I gave the example of someone who seems to be doing well in life now, but they seem to lack their self-worth. With those people, I, I try to dig more into why do you feel that way? And quite often you can break that down to a couple different relationships. And then let's talk about why those words are still impacting you. You know, what did, what did that person mean to you? You know, and then if you could go back, you know, well, first of all, let's say this. Was that person right about you? They said, you'll never amount to anything. Well, if I say you'll never amount to anything and you're now the manager of something or you're just doing something that you love, maybe you're not the manager of anything. Maybe you're a stay-at-home dad and your kids love you. Well, you've accomplished something. Um, so in that case, so you have amounted to something. So that would mean that that person who said that was incorrect. So based on that knowledge, what would you go back and tell your seven-year-old self when you first heard that? Boy, there's so many pieces that you brought up. It's so interesting. <laughs> I, I, um, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, and that's and that the self-awareness that's you're talking about with the self-awareness piece and the emotional intelligence is about this is my reaction. These are my words I say about myself. Where you know why? Why do I have those? You know, those the the fact that those words don't just magically appear in our heads. That, that <laughs> we, we aren't automatically feel have feelings of unworthiness or thinking we're not enough or we're not good enough. It always comes from some messages we received. I love the the values piece that you talk about. Just go back that, to that for a second. I realize how you know we're culturally um, encouraged to be very busy yes. and to be and to be very productive. And, and that's an external value, right? An externally placed value. That's, that's a pretty superficial one. Like you should make lots of money. You should, you know, always be doing something. You should be productive, but you're talking, but I wonder how many questions you have to ask before people start digging under the, the surface things in my, these are my, I, I need to be responsible. And I need to take care of these things. And I value, but what would you value? Well, I value supporting my family. Okay. Well, you know, what about your family do you value you know like digging under the to the to the the true values it's such a um clarifying way to see if you're actually living the life you want based on oh oh, oh under under this busyness and this constant um and pressure i can just stop and breathe and think what do i actually value and we all have those you know whether we thought about them in 15 years or 20 years or not we all have those underlying uh, values that we that give us real meaning in our lives and are important to us and so just having the opportunity to dig those out I think it sounds like a great exercise for anybody to do right well I have for clients I have a I just have a sheet that lists in alphabetical order I want to say about 90 different things and you can just circle you know circle half dozen circle 10 or 15 what are your values and then let's rank them and then how do these apply and then what you can do, like when you spoke of being busy, right? How does that relate to these values? You know, and because sometimes you're so busy because you have to be, but in the middle of your busyness, you're thinking, why am I doing this? It has no value and you need to give it value. So you can look at your values and say, how does this relate? But I've also worked with a lot of young people just working with the military and speaking to groups of people where I have 18, 19 year olds, and they don't even know what their values are. You know, there's this, there's this concept that they teach it's called values-based goals. And when I would talk to, yeah, just your goals aligning with your values. But when I would talk to these young people, I don't, I didn't have goals when I was 19. So there were no values. There were no goals. <laughs> well, my, my goal was to please my parents. You know, yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> we have them, but they're not very good ones necessarily. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so with a lot of these people, you have to dig deeper into just what are your values. And for a lot of them, this is the first time they actually dig into any kind of self-awareness. What do you like? I don't know. What's important to you? I don't know. What's this? What's that? And they may say that the only thing that they like is working out or video games or whatever. And they don't recognize that the reason they, and they don't even love it. They've just become accustomed to it. And what they don't even recognize about themselves is that they've been using that as an escape for 12 or 13 years. Nothing bad happens to me when I'm running on the track, when I'm playing a video game, when I'm watching Netflix, nothing good happens either, but nothing bad happens. And you're okay with nothing good happening because you haven't realized that you deserve to have a good life. So you don't mind nothing good happening. So. But, it may, but it maintains that emptiness. It does. You're, 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 not, you're not depleting yourself, but you're not filling yourself. And that activity, the running on the track, the video games, the Netflix, it, it just turns into a time killer. And the days go, the hours go by, the days go by. And you, have, you haven't, you haven't moved in any direction and in a weird way it's safe but then you go absolutely nowhere and it, right. yeah it's yeah I, i'm guilty on <laughs> two of the three of those the video <laughs> games and the and the um, and the netflix so <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the thing about it is 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 again recognizing what you deserve right? So do I deserve to have this happy, fulfilling life? 
And what everybody does is you will look at people that have that life that you want and you will justify it by saying something about them that shows why they deserve it. You deserve the nice car. You deserve the happy marriage. You deserve the good job. And what we do when we say that those people deserve it is we look at their heart, their character, their intentions. You're a good person. You're kind. You help people. But when we look at ourselves, we don't look at our heart or our character. We look at our results. Hmm. So where I can say you deserve it because you're very kind, you might think I'm kind. But instead of focusing on my kindness, I will say every time I try this, I screw it up. We are, we are notoriously terrible at being objective about ourselves. Right. And, and, and again, that goes back to the self-awareness. Why, why is it that you always turn back to your results? Maybe because when you were a kid and you got called stupid when you got a C minus, you weren't told that you need to increase your work ethic. You were told you're stupid. There's a difference. Right. And, and I feel for kids these days, like uh, uh, there's so many sources of judgment. I mean, we were talking to somebody else who um, was discussing how, again, culturally, we're encouraged to dis disassociate. We have so many opportunities to blank out our, to do what you're talking about before with the Netflix, with the working out, with the video games, with whatever. Like we're surrounded by opportunities to exit our own to escape into a different you know escape out of our lives and so you have kids who you know kids are pretty prescribed in what they're especially nowadays and then with the pandemic i can only imagine like the opportunities to like find to go out into the world and you know try things out and see what your where your interests lie if you're just going to school and going home and don't have any other opportunities i mean i i was a high school english teacher for years and uh I ended up, um, uh, I, long story short, I quit. And then I went to, to substitute teaching for a while. And um, I hadn't been in the schools for quite a long time. And I, I was in our local high school and I was struck with how, how um, frightened and um, uh, resigned so many of the seniors were in a high school where they felt like they didn't really learn anything they cared about. And they didn't have the money or inclination to go to school afterwards. And they just didn't know where to go. Like they hadn't, they didn't know what to do. And I'm wondering how, you know, what, what you, how you work with your own, the 18 year olds that you know, like when you do spend your whole life being told what to do and where to go with very few opportunities to kind of go out and figure out who you are by bouncing up against the world or trying out a bunch of stuff or um, just having lots of experiences. Yeah it's it's hard to figure out what your values are it's hard to figure out what you actually want and do how, how do you work with with kids the kids these I feel, I feel sorry for kids these days I feel like they have a really challenging world to live in and both externally and internally yeah I I completely agree with you there and just when you when you talk about what when they're told what to do and how to do it and so on and then we have a way to quantitatively compare them to everybody else. Standardized tests should all just be burned at the stake. I mean, it, it, it ruined, it's, I, feel, I mean, I, I'll just say it out loud. I feel like it ruined education in my state. And it's, it's one reason I quit was yeah. these, the standardized tests were, um, it took over, the, you know, ate the curriculum whole and didn't serve anybody. Right, and, and so based on that, these kids are thinking, what is, what is my purpose? to score well on a test that I don't care about. Yep. And then, and how, and, you know, even with teachers, and I'll say this just when it comes to empathy, kids begin learning empathy as babies. They don't know what's called empathy. But, and the reason I say that is because the teenagers can tell when the teacher hates the test. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are lots it, of reasons I had to quit, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so if, if the students say, this is stupid, why are we doing it? And the teacher's like, well, because the state, blah, blah, blah. The state says so. Like that's yeah. kind of the only answer we have is this is a graduation requirement. So you have to do it. Not because you're getting anything out of it. Not because it's teaching you something valuable. Just just because. Yeah. And, and so then what happens with these kids is 
you you gotta again look at their values and they have to recognize that they are important and have value outside of those numbers you know and you can challenge anyone go find someone on instagram and find a post where they're failing something. <laughs> Social media is the devil's work when it comes to that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yes. So, so go find that person and you're not gonna find that person. And so there's so many ways to quantify how everyone's better than we are. And so these kids have to be able to recognize their own self-worth. And that's something you're just, there's no self-worth class, right? You, you hate math, you wanna be a musician, but for some reason, you took pre-calculus and you got a D minus and you feel stupid. Like makes makes no sense, right? And so with these kids, we have to look at a couple of things. What are your strengths and what are your values? When I say strengths, what are you good at? And I'll tell you, I specifically will send people to this website, viacharacter.org. Um, and VIA stands for values in action. So viacharacter.org. Hmm. And there's 24 different strengths that they list and so you just you take the the survey and it ranks your strengths in order and so for example one person might be bravery another person leadership another person honesty kindness love of learning appreciation of art and beauty and so then well let's let's combine those you have an appreciation of art and beauty and your value could be you know, nature, right? Someone that, that loves animals and nature. Okay, now we can begin to, I don't wanna say find your purpose because that's, that's cliche, right? So if you haven't found your purpose, why are you alive? That's, that's kind of ridiculous to me. Um, but at the same time, we can start to dig into things that you weren't taught in high school. But understand that these young folks that I've dealt with are already in the military. Um, and so a lot of the struggles that they have are feeling like they're not contributing. Mm -hmm. And so I have to let them know that their life is more than just what they do with the uniform on. For example, when you get off work and you take off the uniform, you can go paint, you can go to a rose garden, you can go play music, you can go do what you love to do. And, oh man, the... <laughs> The, the thing, the barrier to that, the barrier to that is that they wonder what are people going to think about them? That's the barrier to doing what you love to do. I had one client who was so miserable and I just asked her, what did she really love to do? She said, yoga and drawing. Okay, when's the last time you did those? She couldn't remember. So in all of my wisdom, right? I said, um, how about next week you draw some things and do some yoga? She was just, she had created a barrier for herself where she couldn't do those things. And then I gave her permission to do it. And then it's like her whole life changed. And I said, well, guess what? I didn't actually do anything. You did it. And you don't need permission to do it. So these kids, after being told what to do throughout high school and so on and so on, they need to realize they don't have to ask permission to do what they love. They don't have to ask permission to align what they love with their values and their actions, and they can just go do it. You don't need to ask permission to come alive. No, it, it's, it's so, it's so true. You know, it's ignoring one's values and one's passions only for the return on investment, the ROI, isn't going to work because like, not every person is built to be a doctor, a lawyer, like, in a, you know, those, those very high profile kind of paying jobs. And, but there are those who, you know, who love numbers and love doing people's tax returns because they find it, they, they, they get satisfaction from dismantling the puzzle that is the tax code and being like, Ooh, I saved them $500 here. And I save them that. And I'm like, Oh, how, where do I want to put this business expense put it over there? And for other people, that sounds like a horrific nightmare. And so you're totally right in that regard of like, when you can be in tune with yourself, when you have that emotional intelligence with yourself and you, you know what lights you up, you can have, you, and you start to include that in your life, whether or not it is your primary source of income is, is, is kind of irrelevant, but it helps. 
but like it will bring you joy and make the rest of your life worth living because like the example you gave with the person who draws and likes doing yoga like if she built her life around doing that and her day job is facilitating her ability to do those things then when she's doing her day job doing whatever it is she could be like well this is letting me take yoga every day this is letting this is bringing me to a place that's beautiful that i can draw during my lunch break and then all of a sudden their same life is that their life is still the same but their whole frame has changed and now they're like oh i'm doing these things i may not enjoy but it's bring it's allowing me to connect with the parts of me that light me up that bring me true life and you're right with what you say that it's in a weird way people need permission because we've been kind of hit like a nail with a hammer to to align with everyone else to be cookie cutter and it's it's really unfortunate it it really is because the bottom line is that everyone has their own definition of success for everyone else I can define success for you. Oh, you do podcasts. Success looks like this for you, blah, blah, blah. Then I'll sit there by myself and I'll say, what am I doing with my life? You'll never know that I'm asking myself that question. You're like, oh, that guy has his life together. No, we're all sitting in a hole asking ourselves questions. (laughs) But But I can define success for everyone else before I go back to my hole. And a lot of that comes from just your, your value of yourself do I deserve to crawl out of the hole? And for a lot of people, the answer is no, because again, they look at their results. What have I done so far in my life? We've gotten to the point now where everyone has a bachelor's degree. So if you have a bachelor's degree, you still judge yourself. That doesn't mean I'm smart. That doesn't mean I should get a good job. That doesn't mean I deserve to be happy. And in reality, you deserve those things before you went to college. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> you know? No, for sure. <laughs> for sure. And uh, to add on to that, you know, part of it can certainly be the worthlessness and not and wanting to stay in the hole that you believe you deserve to stay in. And then the other part too is once you have the target, it makes it more obvious when you miss. So sometimes yeah. there could be safety and being like, I'm just going to shoot in the dark and hope I hit what I want to hit, but I'm too scared to clear out the darkness and be like, oh, my target's actually over there. And I'm shooting in the completely wrong direction because that stark awareness of like, I am completely on the wrong path is frightening. That you, you know, you've put all this investment, you've gone to college, you got the bachelor's, you got the master's, you kept going, you did all these different things. And all of a sudden, like once you turn the lights on, you're like, oh, I was supposed to walk over there. I was like, crap. And it's like, you have that, like, I, w- I wasted my life kind of moment. And it's, it's jarring. Well, but- you're absolutely right. And, and you talked about like reframing or changing your frame. And so I would say to someone in that position, so you know what it's like to put in the work, you know what it's like to move towards a specific direction. It was the wrong way, but you understand the work. And now that you've identified your target, do the work. Hmm. That's and- super wise. That's <laughs> yeah. super wise. You learned how to, you made distance. You, you were able to cover ground. You just have to change the direction you were walking in. That's interesting. But Stacey, you were going to say something. Yeah. And also, and I think it's important too, to, to um, again, it's self, there's always opportunities for self-judgment. And another one is that I, I think I, I may have missed a little bit of a thread because my, my, my ears went. But anyway, um, and hopefully this isn't totally off base what I'm about to say, but a piece of why people go in one direction to pursue this goal over here is because everyone around them only values you know, choices A, B, and C. And a huge issue was to go, kind of go back to uh, the link the school thing. I mean, it was very clear to me as an English teacher that verbal skills and math skills are the only skills anyone values when it comes to high school. If you aren't a good reader and a writer and a speaker and then can do math, then you're bad at school and all the other areas of intelligence are, are substandard at best. So, you know, so I won't pursue my art degree because that's stupid and it's not gonna get me anywhere because you know, art, is, is, art has no value. 
you know, I, I'm a, a really good basketball player, but of course I'll never, you know, make it doing anything physical because if that has, it has no value. So a lot of people get sidetracked on these on um, less than perfect paths because they were taught that their own actual innate intelligences and, pre- and, and preferences and law- passions are, have no value. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and when we look at value, we're talking about quite often the money, right? So Absolutely. either make it in the NBA <laughs> or you shouldn't play basketball at all. Right. 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 Like you're, you're not allowed to just play the guitar because you love playing the guitar. You need to go, you know, the whole go big or go home. Well, no, I'm already at home and I'm just enjoying playing the guitar. Leave me alone. Right. It's yes. and, and so that's, that's the way that we look at it. And then what happens is you very seldom find people wherever you're looking primarily like social media, you don't find people that are documenting the process of I'm playing the guitar because I enjoy it, but guess what? I also suck at it. And so we see the people who quit playing and the people who are making millions. We don't see anyone in the process. And that applies to things that are outside of math and English. All right, so don't be, don't be the kid in, in, I don't know, natural science, right? Don't be the kid in natural science as you're learning about animals that just wants to look at the clouds. Don't be that kid because where's the value in that? Forget that there's a career field called meteorology. We're not gonna get into that. It's, it's just that, <laughs> <laughs> it's just people will tie it back to, where's the money in looking at clouds? Where's the money at watching shark documentaries? And it's like, can I just enjoy this? Can I just enjoy today? And a lot of people believe they don't have permission to do that. Enjoying your day, doing something you love, playing the guitar, going swimming, walking through the forest, doing something you love just because you love it, that enhances your happiness is looked at by other people as unproductive. And so then you wonder, why am I doing it if I'm not being productive? And the ultimate irony is that it does make you more productive yeah. if, you're in, if you're in positive spirits. Like it just, it opens your mind to more possibility. Like, you know, that 15 or 20 minutes staring up at the clouds could give you inspiration for whatever career you just happen to be in, even if it's not meteorology. And like- <laughs> And that's fine. It's, you know, you know, you could have a huge affection for animals and not turn into the veterinarian, but it doesn't stop you from still embracing that joy and that love for animals in its own way. And it, it still fills your soul and that bleeds over into every other part of your life. You know, just like what you were saying with your client, with the yoga and the drawing, like she was miserable and then once she felt that she had the permission to, to embrace the thing she honestly loved to do, she was happy. And like her colleagues will see that and then be like, oh, she's in a good mood. I wonder what's going on. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> they like working with her more because she is in a good mood. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it is very unfortunate that especially here in the States, this focus on just on, on the money side of it, that, that it's, it, it's all, it's one of many gauges of worthiness and like, yeah, money gives a level of, of comfort and security and access to things, but it's, and we, we need to, we need to, we need to use it to live our lives, but it's not, it's not everything a person can make, a person could be making, you know, $28,000 a year and be having the best life that they could imagine. And a person could be making a million dollars a year and be miserable. And it, it's, 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 like you were kind of what you're saying, it's back going with like, with, even with the trauma, it's like one's person, how someone sees joy in their life is unique to the person. Right. And people might, you know, may not want to swap places with someone else because it may, it's, it might not give them what they want, that kind of thing. Well, yeah, I completely agree with you there because, because we're allowing external forces to define success and happiness for us. And so then what happens when you reach a certain level and you're still not happy, you, 
you again think something's wrong with you. I should be happy because of these external factors. When in reality, if, we, if you look internally, you'll realize that none of these external factors align with your values. And so even when you do great at that job that you hate, you won't be happy because it doesn't align with your values. If, you're, if you have this love of animals and your job is an accountant for big corporations, you can make a lot of money, but you're not happy. You don't know why. Well, you don't even think about animals anymore because you're in a 14th floor loft and you have expensive stuff and there's no room for animals. When in reality, if someone gave you direction and permission to go volunteer at the animal shelter, that would change your whole life. And that's the thing is, is people need to understand that they don't need permission from other people to seek what makes them happy. You deserve to be happy. You need to go out there and seek what makes you happy. And if right now you don't understand what makes you happy, again, let's go back to your values and your character strengths, and then let's build. And then as we're building from there, we recognize these obstacles and barriers. Let's figure out where those came from. When you were four or when you were nine and you said, I want a puppy, and your dad said, that's stupid. You don't even know how to take care of a puppy. And then you end up getting berated because you like puppies. So that taught you to keep your mouth shut about what you like. Mm. And so now here you are, 35, 40 years old, and you're still keeping your mouth shut. So in those instances, so you're, when you're working with your client and you, you, f- you bring them back to the past and you uncover what be, the seed that began this belief that was not, that didn't align up with their values that like you were saying, like, you know, the, the parent who's saying, you know, puppies are dumb. You don't know what you're doing. What do you, what, once that awareness has been made, what do you do with the client from that point? Well, so, so like I said earlier, part of it is, is recognizing, okay, you know, what, maybe what your, what your father may have said to you, were they right or wrong? You know, were they, were they incorrect? And if the answer is yes, and then what did you feel at that moment? And you'll be surprised how many people, like you don't remember much from when you were five or six years old, but you remember that one time when something was said to you. Those things will stick. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they stick. And so, and then I, so I say, you know, what would you say to yourself if you could go back and, and comfort yourself? Or I will say, what did you need in that moment that wasn't there? And for a lot of kids, it's just a hug or not to feel alone, Mm. right? So that's why some kids, what happens is you will be made to feel stupid and you'll bust out crying, but then another parent or sibling comes along and gives you a hug. And when that happens, it turns off or minimizes your stress response. And then you're back in uh, an emotional safe space. But if that doesn't happen for you, then you just kind of wallow in that unsafe space. And when I say unsafe, I'm talking about unsafe to the seven-year-old, right? But then a couple other things that need to happen is, is people need to recognize that when you are told those things by an adult, by a parent, older sibling or whatever, that was not a reflection of how much they did or did not love you. That was not a reflection of your value. So if your parents said, you're so stupid, they did not actually mean your brain doesn't function a certain way what was really going on was they didn't know a better way to say to you something like, I want you to put more energy towards something where you can have a good career and a happy life. They didn't know how to say that to you and they didn't know how you would receive it at the age of seven. So instead they said, you're so stupid. And and so because your parents can love you with all their heart and do their best and at times their best wasn't very good, which means that they were normal parents. Yeah, that's yeah. it's true because parents are human just like the rest of us and they do what they can and the random things that stick could be that one moment where you you know the parent got caught off in a, in a bad day and they just were like, you know, shut up about the dog and then all of a sudden yeah. it 
that ripples out for for decades in the child and it's just it's, the parent doesn't even remember the instant incident anymore but for the right. child it's this pivotal moment you know and, and I'll, uh, i think go ahead. go ahead oh no i was just gonna say that i also deal with clients on the flip side the parent that wants to quit calling their child stupid hmm mm. and the reason a lot of parents are like that is because that's what they dealt with growing up because all of their kid, all of their friends' parents seemed perfect. Because <laughs> all their friends' parents were the perfect parents, and their parents were not. Their parents always called them stupid and all these other things. And so they don't know what else to do. And so what they do is that's all they know. So that's what they do. And then after they do that, they feel shame, they feel guilt, and, and they feel like worthless. But at the same time, they're like, I've never seen a parent apologize, so I don't know how to apologize to my kids. Mm. And so I, I work through that with them a lot. And, and a lot of that, again, goes back to the self-judgment versus accountability. Don't say I'm a bad parent. Say, what are my options? What can I do differently next time? look at these individual events and say, do I need to atone for that? When I say atone for that, I don't mean buy ice cream. I mean, apologize. There's a difference. Because I don't, I don't want to make you feel horrible and then buy you ice cream every time. And then as an adult, that's your go-to every time you feel bad is ice cream instead of accountability. And once again, it's that, it's that whole... Um just like you're saying with the Instagram thing, the parents only see the good moments. They don't see the moments where the parents are like, you know, they do something by a true honest mistake or they forget and then it upsets their kid. And then they act in front of other parents or other people, they're like, I'm sorry, buddy, you're right. I messed up. So let's, you know, let's fix this and we'll make it work. And like that, that doesn't happen as often, just like in the Instagram thing. It's like, oh, it's always the perfect parents with the perfect kids. And it's like, no, there's, there's still those moments where the kids and the parents are both screaming and crying at each other because they're both frustrated. It's just part of life. But, um, but Stacey, you're going to say something. Yeah. I, um, I love hearing that you're working with parents who are noticing that they have these, these behaviors that they want to change. I've been speaking to a, um, a group of therapists recently about, about um, generational trauma and how it's every single parent of this generation can look back at their own parents' experiences as children. Like basically every generation has had some traumatic events, right? We have World War I, World War II, we have depression, we have the 60s and, and civil rights movement, we have this and you have, um, um, economic crises, the alcoholism, there's so many things that run, they, they say run in families when it's actually just, you know, a, a parent with an alcohol problem has doesn't have a lot of tools for giving you know, being a uh, providing a nourishing environment for their child and then that child grows up with their own issues with race so this having some self-compassion and it's like basically that everyone can look back at their own parents' childhoods and say oh they had a really hard time because like, we often know our family history to some degree right that like I know my my grandfather, I had a grandfather was an alcoholic, a grandmother with an anxiety disorder, you know, there's all these things. And so of course it has an impact on how you yourself was raised by parents who had that experiences and knowing that there's just stuff to heal. And it's no one's at this point, it's no one's it's not your fault that you don't have the tools you want to have for your children. It's, you were raised by people who didn't have the tools and they were raised by people who didn't have the tools and they were raised by like, like how many generations we go back before we find, you know people who are healthy, happy, and able to raise their children without some terrible traumatic event happening <laughs> or, you know, so, or, or illness or whatever. So, um, so just having that self-compassion for their own family lineage with their, you know, that I'm not a good parent. I don't have the tools. I didn't, I didn't learn. Yeah. Well, there's a reason for that. And, and we don't even need to blame our parents because they also weren't given the tools either. And just having that that awareness, I think, is so important when, when we turn to parenting our own kids, but then also realizing, oh, I need to get the tools. Like, okay, I didn't, there's a bunch of things I learned that I don't like about how I raise my kids or how I speak to them or how I think about myself. 
but I can fix this. I can talk to someone and, and, and get those tools now. You're, you're absolutely right. And I believe for a lot of parents, the barrier to getting those tools is shame. Mm. I don't want to admit that I need more tools. I don't want to admit that I don't know what I'm doing. And you'll find for a lot of, a lot of kids who are struggling with a lot of these issues, right? The self-esteem, like just the overwhelming feeling worthless or whatever, they, those kids don't know how their parents were raised. Mm -hmm. they, I, yeah, yeah, I realized that there's, there's just going to be like, there's, there's less cohesion in the like, in nuclear families tend to be kind of isolated now. You know, the, the, at least in, I know in my community, there wasn't a lot of connection to our, you know, the aunts and uncles and grandparents. So in hearing the family stories and so, yeah, not being aware, that's true. I think in America, especially in the United States, especially it's a big problem. People just don't know where they're, don't know much about their roots. Right. And, and so what we're able to do is we're able to look at our parents and look at the good in them and then not even recognize, essentially, I, I don't, I want to say where the bad in us came from, but when I say the bad, I mean all the things that we use to judge ourselves. Hmm. We don't know where that came from because we think that our parents did well. And what I mean by they did well is I was called stupid because I was stupid. You know what I mean? So that wasn't my parents' fault. I should have known better, right? And then you, you can see if you're one of those families that you have connections with your aunts and uncles and grandparents, everyone's happy in your face. Like you're 11 years old and your grandparents are so full of love. You don't know how your grandparents treated your parents when they were 11. It's and often so, very different. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and and the, reason, the reason grandparents treat their grandkids so much better is because they've learned from their mistakes. <laughs> oh yeah, the grandchildren are the, sec are the second draft. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I can't wait for grandkids. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do so much. I'll do such a better job. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so, and so there's there's so much there's so much shame with that, and it's like we gotta just tell people like you don't have to be ashamed of who you are. Like if you were to make, here's the thing, if you were to make a list of the good things and the bad things about you, for the good things, you might list your character and the bad things, you will list failures. And you will actually try harder to fill that list. You'll actually put more effort into listing everything that's wrong with you if you have this negative perspective of yourself, if you're living with shame. And so, you have to get over that before you say, I am not ashamed that I need help as a parent. I am not ashamed. Like you actually have to not be ashamed to say that and go get the tools. And so I, that's, that's, I'm doing more of that work as well. And just getting people to recognize, you know what? Can you honestly say you did the best that you could? And the answer is, yes, I didn't know what else to do. Okay, well, let's talk about your effort. Why did you try that hard? Even if it was a mistake, why did you try that hard? Oh, because I love my kids, because I love this. I love my parents. I love my wife. I love my husband. Okay, so let's start with the love and build from there instead of starting from the shame or the event. Let's start with the love. And then, and then just that positive mindset, right? Just just the idea that, okay, now that we're starting with love, let's cultivate those thoughts in our minds and then let that inspire us to overcome the shame and find the tools. But it's a process. It's forming the new pathways in the brain, right? Yes, exactly. It's, it's a process and you have to be able to recognize, and again, this goes back to the, the self-awareness and emotion regulation. You have to recognize when your brain is not accustomed to these new changes. So it creates a new barrier. Hmm. Like, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got some new tools, but you're still the same idiot. Oh, okay. Let me, let me just breathe in the positivity, breathe out the negativity, and then learn how to use the tools. Let me dispute that thought that came into my head from nowhere. You know, what I tell people is you, you never have intrusive thoughts that are so overwhelmingly positive. 
I, in the middle of the night, I never had this thought like, you're a good looking dude. That's not what I, that's not what comes to my mind. <laughs> it's like, you remember that thing you forgot on Wednesday? Yeah, you're probably going to forget again tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, those are the thoughts. So how do we, how do we manage those thoughts? And we have to reframe our perception of ourselves and our mindset. And a lot of the reframing your mindset is, I deserve to be happy. I'm this kind of parent. I'm doing my best. My kids don't deserve a better parent. They deserve more effort from me. When I say more effort, I don't mean trying harder. I mean, trying better, right? Like, I, like I've heard about um, evolution. I've, I've, and, I, and I go with this, right? It was never the survival of the fittest, the survival of the strongest. It's the survival of the most adaptable. So you have to be able to sing. Yeah. That's a whole new take, isn't it? <laughs> if it was the survival of the strongest, we still have T-Rexes running around. That's true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think Darwinism has been used and abused in terrible ways yeah. over the last 150 years or whenever the heck he came up with it. So instead of trying to parent harder or, or becoming a stronger parent, become adaptable. Okay, I don't hug my kids enough. I'm going to hug them more. I don't say enough positive things to them in the morning. I'm going to say more positive things. And you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. One thing I, I'll tell parents is when your kids get home from school, don't say, how was your day? Did anything funny happen today? Did anything make you laugh at school today? Did you do anything that you're proud of? Or what did you work hardest on? And to get them to intentionally come up with positive thoughts that can set their mindset for the rest of the day. Like, yeah, I worked hard on that. And then maybe we'll find something to laugh about together, right? You know, and, and so let's just change our conversation. Let's choose positivity in our words. And that's hard for parents to do because their parents didn't do that. <laughs> right. It's a whole new skill set. But my God, how valuable, because in fact, you're helping your kids learn self-awareness much earlier. Yes. And then that, that provides the foundation for them to grow, to grow into their values, to grow into their meaning and their purpose. And, and I say grow into it because you're so young, you're developing. It's completely different than, it's, it's completely different than someone that maybe feels or believes you know, say you've been doing a certain job for 20 or 30 years or whatever. And, and so you look at time differently. But when you're 14 years old, you can allow your purpose to evolve over. You can slow down. I, I wonder how many kids out there, like, have parents that don't know what they love. I say an awful lot. Yeah, you just, you have no idea that your kid loves to draw. Just what you say is, why do you keep going through the crayons so fast? How much coloring do you do at school? So then if that's the question, then I'm afraid to show you what I've been working on. You know, and so when we open up those safe spaces and pathways for our children, then we can grow an entire generation of people with emotional intelligence and empathy and compassion. You know, and that's, I mean, I mean yeah, that, that could open up another couple hour conversation. <laughs> I know. I mean, that, that would just change the whole world, you know, having yeah. people who are emotionally intelligent, self-aware, and can feel compassion for self and others. Like that's kind of, kind of the magic bullet in my mind. I mean, not like it's easy, to, it's easy, it's easy to, it's an easy concept, but the act, but it's hard to do that everyone gets to that point. It, although I, although that being said, like you said to the, um, the child who, you know, lets their, um, uh, you know, lets their world evolve and, and exploring their, their love, their, um, what they love and, and such. I think, I feel everyone, no matter what their age is, has the opportunity, like, thank God for neuroplasticity, right? That our like, brains, there is that, that horrible phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks is just a flat out lie, right? That, you know, that we're always, capable of expanding our awareness and forming new pathways and you know expanding our awareness of ourselves and exploration and 
And um, I, I find out at you know fifty, I found out at fifty, you know, age forty-five years old that I love to do massage. Like, what the heck? You know, <laughs> that's a surprise. Yeah, it, but it can happen any moment where you, as long as you're open and and um, and I think it's a, a piece of it too is just allowing ourselves to be open and you know to whatever uh, experiences are out there for us to to try out and not assume anything about our capabilities or what we're or what we deserve. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And so many of those assumptions about our capabilities and what we deserve are based on other people's perceptions and our fear of judgment. And so we, when we can get over that, then we can go explore new things. And what a lot of people don't realize is how beautiful it is when your kids and grandkids can see you doing that. When your kids see you exploring new stuff, how does that impact their perspective? You know, like even even for me now, the things that I'm doing now, just with my business and stuff, I, I wasn't doing, I hadn't even really thought of this two years ago. So my kids can see my evolution. And, rec and, and so then I have a conversation with them, like, do it now. And if you decide by the time you're 25 that it sucks and you don't like it, that's okay. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's okay. We have this idea that you have to have this career and stuff locked down by a certain age because the truth is you probably needed that when you came of age in 1954, but not in 2021. Because in 1954, at the age of 20, a lot of people at the age of 20 were, were already married. They're, I mean, college degree wasn't really a thing for a lot of people. So you went to work and you learned to work hard and that was it. And you worked you know, however many hours it took, and then that was it. And so now those people are telling young people about their values and work ethic and so on. And the generations, they just, it doesn't work. You can't have that collaboration. These, these kids these days, like, honestly, I've seen some kids that are like at the age of 14 are making money day trading because they love it. <laughs> they, they are. fabulous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they do it on their phone. And those same kids at the age of 30 might decide that they want to be painters or authors or something else. And that's okay. Like we got to give people the room to explore, to discover, to pivot. And we can't do that we can't do that if we're afraid to do that for ourselves. If I'm afraid to pivot and I'm scared, it's going to show. My fear is going to be thrust upon you when I say, don't do that because you never know this. And what if this happens? What if that happens? And so I'm allowing my fear to be a barrier to other people. And it's that same fear that's keeping me miserable. Right? And so we really have to continue to grow ourselves and then bring other people along with, with us on the journey. We can all grow together. Then we learn about things like empathy and encouragement, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. It always starts with us, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nice. This is like a fabulous place to pause and, and uh, wrap up, actually. <laughs> yeah. No, agreed. Yeah, do you mean last? So someone who's so the last thought. There's someone who's miserable and doesn't want to be miserable anymore. What what do you say to that person? Man, the the first step, the absolute first step, if you're miserable and you don't want to be miserable, is taking responsibility for your misery. You can't say I'm miserable. I don't want to be miserable anymore. Help me change my life. No. You have to change your own life. You have to take responsibility. And so for me, when I talk about the incremental things, because for people like that, I always get into your values, you know, and, and maybe there's something more specific, right? Like one, one individual I was talking to, he just flat out hated his job and he worked too much. Okay, well, you're not quitting tomorrow, right? So that's not happening. Um, but still, when we get into the values, the thoughts, the actions, things like that, that means nothing if you don't take ownership of your life, of your misery. You are responsible and you don't need anyone else's permission to get out of your misery. 
You deserve to be happy. And the truth is you have to believe that to own it. You have to believe you deserve to be happy to do something about it. Because if you don't believe that, it's gonna be hard for you to take action because it's hard to do things that go against your beliefs. So the number one step to getting out of misery is to take responsibility for your misery. Fabulous. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for Absolutely, sharing yeah. your sharing your wisdom with us and uh, speaking with us today. It's so great to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I loved it. I love these conversations. I love just your energy and perspective, both of you guys on the whole thing. And, you know, maybe we'll just continue to work to find more like-minded people to, you know, to, to help people grow and learn to, to love themselves and to be happy. Absolutely. One person at a time, for sure. I'm, I'm thrilled you're doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. And how can people reach out to you if they like to work with you? Well, the, the easiest thing right now is just, um, you can email me directly or go to my website. Um, my website is www.charlsongains.com. And then my email address is info at charlsongains.com. Awesome. And we'll also put that information in the show notes for our viewers and listeners to be able to reach out to you. All but right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lovely conversation. And thank you listeners and viewers for joining us for the ride. And we'll talk to all of you next time. Thank you.